We are glad to announce the following ministry opportunities and services for all COP members during the current GCQ. Our Fortress 91 is open for a short 15-minute service from Tuesday to Friday at 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturday to Sunday anytime between 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on all campuses except Pampanga. The COP main campus will have two entrances and venues, the Taft Avenue Lobby, Mezzanine, and the River Room. Each service is limited to nine people per venue. Morning Devotions, our weekday online program, continues Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m., with the evening service streaming every Monday to Thursday at 7 p.m. Our weekend online services begin with the Friday service at 6.30 p.m. You may choose any of the following times to attend the main service. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. Or watch back on YouTube at the time of your choice. Thank you for loving God and loving to be in the services. Please don't hesitate to let us know any way we may serve you further.
We are glad to announce the following ministry opportunities and services for all COP members during the current GCQ. Our Fortress 91 is open for a short 15-minute service from Tuesday to Friday at 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturday to Sunday anytime between 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on all campuses except Pampanga. The COP main campus will have two entrances and venues, the Taft Avenue Lobby, Mezzanine, and the River Room. Each service is limited to nine people per venue. Morning Devotions, our weekday online program, continues Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m., with the evening service streaming every Monday to Thursday at 7 p.m. Our weekend online services begin with the Friday service at 6.30 p.m. You may choose any of the following times to attend the main service. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. Or watch back on YouTube at the time of your choice. Thank you for loving God and loving to be in the services. Please don't hesitate to let us know any way we may serve you further.
We are glad to announce the following ministry opportunities and services for all COP members during the current GCQ. Our Fortress 91 is open for a short 15-minute service from Tuesday to Friday at 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturday to Sunday anytime between 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on all campuses except Pampanga. The COP main campus will have two entrances and venues, the Taft Avenue Lobby, Mezzanine, and the River Room. Each service is limited to nine people per venue. Morning Devotions, our weekday online program, continues Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m., with the evening service streaming every Monday to Thursday at 7 p.m. Our weekend online services begin with the Friday service at 6.30 p.m. You may choose any of the following times to attend the main service. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. Or watch back on YouTube at the time of your choice. Thank you for loving God and loving to be in the services. Please don't hesitate to let us know any way we may serve you further.
We are glad to announce the following ministry opportunities and services for all COP members during the current GCQ. Our Fortress 91 is open for a short 15-minute service from Tuesday to Friday at 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturday to Sunday anytime between 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on all campuses except Pampanga. The COP main campus will have two entrances and venues, the Taft Avenue Lobby, Mezzanine, and the River Room. Each service is limited to nine people per venue. Morning Devotions, our weekday online program, continues Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m., with the evening service streaming every Monday to Thursday at 7 p.m. Our weekend online services begin with the Friday service at 6.30 p.m. You may choose any of the following times to attend the main service. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. Or watch back on YouTube at the time of your choice. Thank you for loving God and loving to be in the services. Please don't hesitate to let us know any way we may serve you further.
We are glad to announce the following ministry opportunities and services for all COP members during the current GCQ. Our Fortress 91 is open for a short 15-minute service from Tuesday to Friday at 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturday to Sunday anytime between 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on all campuses except Pampanga. The COP main campus will have two entrances and venues, the Taft Avenue Lobby, Mezzanine, and the River Room. Each service is limited to nine people per venue. Morning Devotions, our weekday online program, continues Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m., with the evening service streaming every Monday to Thursday at 7 p.m. Our weekend online services begin with the Friday service at 6.30 p.m. You may choose any of the following times to attend the main service. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. Or watch back on YouTube at the time of your choice. Thank you for loving God and loving to be in the services. Please don't hesitate to let us know any way we may serve you further.
Well, hello there, and welcome to our COP online weekend service. We haven't done it exactly like this for a while, but it's so good that we can be together in this way, isn't it? God is always good. He is good to us. How do we open every online service? We are reading Psalm 91, so let's read it together. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen, amen, amen. You know, today, before we worship the Lord together, I want to read to you Psalm 118, verse 25. It says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. We know, and God knows, what all of us are going through right now, what you are going through in your life, in your business, in the education of your kids in finances, in relationships, in the plans you have, plans to do normal life things like dedicate your baby to the Lord or to get married or to change your job, these normal things. God knows all the specifics of what is going on in your life. So this is just a very good prayer. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray. Give us success. But not only is that a very good prayer for us to pray any day, it's very specifically a good prayer for us to pray this weekend. Why? Because this cry to God, save us. You know what that is? Hosanna. <laughs> Hosanna. Perfect for a Palm Sunday weekend. Hosanna. Save us, we pray, O Lord. Oh, Lord, we pray, give us success. But I want you to remember that story of Palm Sunday when Jesus came in riding on the donkey and the people were waving palm branches. It was our cry to God, save us, oh God, grant us success. It's not a weepy cry. It's not, oh God, save us. It's not a defeated, discouraged cry. It's a cry of victory. It's a cry of praise. It's not painful. It's victorious. It's not, we hope you will. It's confident that our God sees us and he saves us. He sees our situation and he helps us. We know that when we lift our eyes toward heaven and we cry out, oh Lord, save us, Oh, Lord, give us success. We know that he hears the cry of the righteous. We know that we can call upon his name and he will hear us. We know that if we ask anything according to his will, 
he hears us and we have that request that we have asked of him. We know that there is the sound of victory in the tents of the righteous. And so right now today, don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. Be full of courage. Be full of victory in your house. And as we are about to worship the Lord, why don't we all stand up together and worship him with all the confidence and the joy and the expectation of victory in our lives. As we have cried out, Lord, save us, grant us success. Amen. Let's worship God together.
Before we get into our offering thought, I want to again remind you that we're working very, very hard to try to get something open. Now, we do have Fortress 91 fully functional. Um, South, East, Maine, North, and Bulacan. Pampanga is fully open, so you can have all the services you want. And please forgive us, Pampanga, if we envy you a little bit. And I, I don't know why we can't get the permits at South for um, in Las Pinas for the drive-in services this year. We've done it before under uh, ECQ and MECQ, so I don't understand what's different now. Um, but we're working very hard to get all this done. So please forgive me if my frustration is showing just a little bit. We know that you want to be in God's house. We know that you don't want to lose another Easter. We understand and we're doing our very best. Please pray with us that we can have favor and we can get at least some drive-in services going. Now for our offering thought today, I want to take you back again to what we've been learning. And really, these are not new thoughts. Yes, I've made them bigger and longer and I've studied more and I've learned more. But some of these are the thoughts that I used back in the 80s and 90s when we went through all those downsizing of companies, the retrenchments, the the people losing their jobs during the big economic crisis in the 80s and again in the 90s. And I taught you how to be retainable and promotable. And I've been hearing really good testimonies of our members as their companies even now, even this last week, went through downsizing and our members not only retained their jobs, but they either got salary increases or promotions. So th this is the purpose of this teaching, how to be retainable and promotable. Now, we said that, that there's three types of employees in every company. There are the people that management is talking about because they're doing so well and they're on their way up. There are people that management are talking about and they're not doing well and they're on their way out. And then there's this large group of invisibles that the management never talks about until times like this. This is when mediocrity will not do. In seasons like this, this is where mediocrity will be destructive to your career and destructive to your family. These are days where we step up and we do our best and we work with all of our heart as unto the Lord. Now, we're right now we're focusing on these people that are the first to go. The first to go are those that are being noticed in the wrong way. And these are the people who bring toxins into a company. We said that toxins do not exist naturally in nature. They are produced by another living organism like red tide. We said lazy people create a toxic environment. Proverbs 10, verse 26, New Living Translation. Lazy people irritate their employers. Now, again, they may not irritate anybody else on staff, but they irritate the people who are responsible to get the work done. They may be nice to everybody else. They may be popular with everybody else, but they're an irritation to the people who have to make decisions. Now, you don't want to be an irritation to somebody who's making decisions about you keeping your job. I mean, you, you don't want that person to notice you in an irritated way. So we said, all right, we don't want to be lazy people. We said that lazy people, first of all, release and develop bad attitudes, these toxins toward leadership in the workplace. Secondly, lazy people create and release deep resentment. And we saw all the reasons for that resentment last weekend. Now I want to take it a step farther. And I want you to see that lazy people are brothers to those who destroy. And this is a toxin in every company. And you'll see why it's so toxic as we go. Proverbs 18, verse 9. Whoever is slack in his work, who's ever lazy in his work, doesn't fulfill his quotas, doesn't get his work done on time, doesn't turn in his reports on time, whatever. Whoever is slack in his work, Proverbs 18, 9, is a brother to him who destroys. Now notice, a lazy person is of the same family as those who destroy. They destroy a family business. They destroy a company. They destroy a sales team. They are part of the destroyer clan. Now, you, you have to get this into your heart because they may be a really nice person. They may have a really nice personality. They, they may be wonderful at getting along with everybody and everybody likes them. They may even be the life of the party. But in truth, they are related to destruction. They are part of the family of destroyers. Now, let me give you five truths why very quickly. Number one, a lazy person is destructive of assets. 
because of their attitude toward maintenance. Let me say that again. A lazy person is destructive of assets because of their attitudes toward maintenance. Proverbs 24, verse 30 and 31. I pass by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was overgrown with thorns, and the ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was breaking down. See, a lazy person will not maintain what they have. You know, one of the things I look at with people is, you know, a lazy person won't even polish their shoes. <laughs> okay. A lazy person doesn't take care of anything they have. A lazy person, you, you can give them a car to use and they don't maintain it. It's full of scratches. They don't change the oil. Uh, they don't keep it clean inside. You've got bugs and cockroaches inside the car. Ugh. You know, a, a lazy person, whatever asset you give them, they don't maintain it. Now, I'm not talking about someone who accidentally drops a cell phone. Okay. I mean, please, all of us are klutzes at times and we, we drop things. I'm not talking about somebody who makes a mistake with a computer and, and, and breaks a screen. I'm not talking about somebody who, who accidentally spills a cup of coffee on their keyboard. I mean, please, accidents happen. But when you have someone who everything you hand them is destroyed, yeah, you got a lazy person. They won't maintain their own personal equipment. If they won't maintain what belongs to them, like a good way to make an employee decision is go look at their house. Now, folks, please, you, you, we may live on a dirt floor, but it could be a clean dirt floor. Okay, we, we may not have much, but what we have is clean and taken care of. Now, you look at a person's home and you see they don't maintain what they have. They're not going to maintain the equipment of a company also. They're not going to maintain the computers their desks, their chairs, their cell phones. If they don't care about their own assets, they're not going to care about any of the company equipment that's assigned to them either. They are brother to destroyers. And this is going to be a constant toxic situation in the office because you're always going to have these people wanting more equipment and complaining that they don't have what they need to work with, but they break and they destroy everything they touch. Secondly, a lazy person is not just destructive of assets. A lazy person is destructive of opportunities. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 27. Whoever is slothful will not roast his game, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. Well, let me read that to you from the New Living. Lazy people don't even cook the game they catch, but the diligent make use of everything they find. The diligent make use of everything they find. So we have a comparison contrast here. A lazy person does not value and will not take advantage of an opportunity that's placed right in their hand. Now, anybody who's ever tried to grow a company understands. Anybody who's tried to do sales understands. Opportunities are where growth and blessings come from. But you see, a lazy person just looks at an opportunity as more work. <laughs> I looked at a pastor one time who was lazy and was no longer with us. And I asked him to go and visit this family. And he didn't want to go visit them because they lived so far away. I said, but they drive into us every Sunday. I said, you, you can visit them. Well, he would not visit them. So it really irritated me. So I went out and visited that family. I drove all the way out myself. Left 4.30 one morning, drove out and visited them. Was back in the office. I didn't get a lot done that day. I didn't get back in the office until 10.30 or 11 that morning. But it was a long drive, heavy traffic. But the family came every Sunday to be with us. I mean, please, if, if they can drive in every Sunday to be with us, I can go out and visit the family. Well, I went out and visited the family. You have no idea how many people got saved on that day. The relatives that they had waiting the neighbors that they had waiting. It, it was like a mini crusade. When I came back, I called the young man and I said, you know what? You could have had a tremendous harvest of souls. You could have opened four connect groups today. But instead, you know what? You're not going to be the, the district pastor of this area anymore. I said, I gave you an opportunity and you just saw it as work. Now, see, a lazy person never sees joy in opportunity. A lazy person just thinks it's more work to do. So, all right, destructive of assets, 
destructive of opportunities. Thirdly, a lazy person is self-destructive. Proverbs 19.24 The sluggard buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. New Living Lazy people take food in their hand but won't even lift it to their, <laughs> to their mouth. <laughs> a lazy person will walk into Mung Inasau with eat all you can and they'll get the chicken and rice in their fingers and they won't even pick it back up to their mouth. That's a lazy person. See, a lazy person is destructive to themselves because they won't take care of themselves. Now, if they won't take care of themselves, they don't care about the survival of the company either. And now here's something you really need to get. Because they have no motivation to take care of themselves, reward motivation doesn't mean anything to them. You can promise them bonuses if you get this done, and, and they won't do the work. <laughs> Reward motivation does not motivate a lazy person. Fourthly, all right, so we've got destructive of assets, destructive of opportunities, self-destructive. The next one, a lazy person is destructive because they invite a spiritual force called poverty. Proverbs 24, verse 32. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. New Living Translation. Verse 34. Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit and scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. You must understand that poverty is a spiritual force. Just like there are people that are sick because of biological causes, and then they're sick because of spiritual causes. There are people that are poor for reasons, and some of those reasons are spiritual reasons. Poverty is a spiritual force. Poverty is attracted to lazy people. Just like you've often heard me say, faith brings the presence of God, fear invites the attack of Satan. Poverty attacks the lazy. Poverty doesn't attack hardworking people. Poverty is attracted to laziness, and poverty will pounce on you, and scarcity will attack you. Now, when you have lazy people working for you in your company, listen, forgive me, you've got a spiritual force of poverty attacking your company. Wow. The fifth one, very quickly. Lazy people are destructive because they are, they are know-it-all, big-mouth, do-nothings. Lazy people are destructive because they are know-it-all, big mouth, do-nothings. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let me read it to you in New Living Translation. Verse 10 and verse 11 and 12. Even while we were working with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Yet we hear some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus to settle down, work, and to earn their living. Now notice, they live idle lives, they refuse to work, and they meddle in other people's business. Lazy people are professional critics. Remember I taught you last weekend, lazy people think they're smarter than everybody else. They're professional critics. They stick their nose in everybody else's business. They criticize what everybody else is doing. They are destructive to team morale because they think they're so superior and they've got a big mouth and they stick their big nose into everybody else's business and that destroys morale. So, all right, I've taught you five things today. I've taught you lazy people are destructive of assets, destructive of opportunities, destructive of their personal life. They invite the spiritual attack of poverty and scarcity, and their know-it-all, big-mouth, do-nothings. These are not people that we want to be. We want to be hard workers in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, would you put your tithe together in the red envelopes, put your seed in the blue envelopes, and no, you cannot come to the altar and bring your offerings. But what you can do is set it aside in a desk drawer, and the next time we have services, you can come and bring those offerings as an act of worship to the Lord. Amen? Say, well, Pastor, why don't you keep pushing us like other churches to give online? Because I've always taught you. I know some people can't, but I've always taught you, if at all possible, you bring the tithe and you bring the seed as an act of worship. Amen? All right, now we've got a great special number for you.
next week at COP, the gospel is not chained. Our mighty men in uniform were able to see 343 souls saved from the Army Recruitment Center, the Philippine Navy Fleet, and the Police Force. This week at COP, our COP Dubai with Pastor Al Jeff saw another 12 people saved through their online outreach called I Turn to You. This week at COP, our Missions Leadership Development Team held a workshop with 130 leaders and branch pastors participating. This included leadership from national and international branches and soon-to-be branches. Many thanks to the speakers who shared such wisdom and guidance. This week at COP, we thank God for the harvest God is blessing our members with. No pandemic and no lockdown can stop Him from fulfilling His great promises. Pastoral student Sister Lulu Pasha of Dubai dedicated her new Toyota Rush. Pastors Rochi and Al Jeff Urag dedicated their new car. The Vasquez family dedicated their Suzuki Ertiga. The Pasqua family dedicated their Innova. From COP Isabella, the principal of the local school, asked Pastor Adrich to dedicate their new building and praise God for six teachers saved. The Cambia family dedicated their Sari Sari store. The Dekel family dedicated their farm fish pond and poultry business. The Beato family dedicated their photo studio business to the Lord. The Dela Cruz siblings dedicated their roast pork and chicken business. The Verosa family dedicated their mini grocery and rice business. This week at COP, go 200 churches. Let's visit Gumaca Quezon, where it all started in January with nine attendees by a messenger call. Now, up to 60 people attend our COP video service with 50 of those face to face and another 10 by a messenger. The testimonies abound of changed lives and blessed families. They have also seen 15 people water baptized so far this year. Finally, on this week at COP, for all of you who are new to our COP family, can you spot the knot? If someone calls you or approaches you claiming to be a pastor and wanting to pray for you, if that pastor is approaching you in person, you should visibly see their current COP pastoral ID being worn. If not, that person is not a COP pastor. If a person claiming to be a COP pastor asks you for money for any reason, that person is not a COP pastor. This includes asking for money to be sent to a GCash account or even if they have COP giving envelopes in their hand. Our pastors simply will never ask you for money. Check out the person's social media accounts. Are they filled with wonderful testimonies of what God has done? Filled with pastors' morning devotions or evening services? Filled with COP announcements? Then that is most likely really someone from COP. If not, then it is not a COP pastor. Oh, how about if a person claiming to be a pastor tries to engage you in business? Absolutely, that person is not a COP pastor. If the person does not clearly identify himself or herself as, Hi, I'm Pastora so-and-so from this certain campus, then definitely they are not a COP pastor. Our COP pastors will identify themselves clearly and unmistakably. All COP pastors should message you first, setting up appointments for phone calls. This gives you time to prepare. Hope this helps you as you settle into being part of our COP family. We welcome you and want the best for you always. It has been another great week at COP. Well, it has been quite a week and it gets more confusing by the minute. We don't know what service we will have, what percentage we will have, if we will have, what kind of drive-in, if we will have. Uh, if I sound confused, it's, <laughs> I think we all are right now. But somehow, some way, we're going to get through this weekend, and Jesus is Lord, and it will be well with us. So I want to encourage you, however you, you can, let's be in God's house this weekend. And if it's sitting there at home listening, then I wanted to make sure that we have something for you. Um, next week during Holy Week, I mean, this is a week that changed the world. I mean, this was the pivot point of, of all mankind's history. I mean, we even changed the calendar 
We have B.C. and A.D. I mean, everything changed with Jesus. So this is a very significant time for us. So next week, I do want to try to make things a little special. In the evening, since we cannot have, you know, a nine-hour school of the cross, what we're going to do is similar to what we did last year, only we're going to take and do a little bit of school of the cross uh, every night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night. We won't get the whole thing in. We'll, we'll, we'll get a, a big piece of it in. And then in the mornings, I'm going to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I'm going to walk you through the events of those days. I mean, what what happened in the first Holy Week on those days? And just put together the chronology of Scripture and and just walk you through, and that will be our devotional readings in the mornings to focus our hearts on what Jesus did for us. Now, I took my big, long sermon and put it away, and I've, I've put together a few thoughts that I want to talk to you about Palm Sunday, because this is Palm Sunday weekend, and I wanted everybody to at least get focused a little bit, okay? Get, get off of COVID-19 and get off of lockdowns and focus on what Jesus did for us. Now, on the Friday night preceding Palm Sunday, we know that Jesus spent Shabbat, which starts on Friday sundown and ends on Saturday sundown. We know that Jesus spent that Shabbat with the family of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, in the city of Bethany, about three kilometers or four kilometers outside of the ancient city of Jerusalem, walking by the Mount of Olives, going up the Mount of Olives on the same road that we walk down every year, same road, they say because that the roads don't change. And he was out there in the city of Bethany. We know he had a beautiful dinner with Lazarus and Simon the leper and friends who loved him from, from John 11 and from Luke chapter 12. We know it was a beautiful time. And uh, the only thing that spoiled it was Jesus got his bad attitude because he thought Jesus was being wasteful. You know, Jesus, you're being wasteful. This could be sold and given to the poor. But, you know, the only thing is Judas wanted more money for himself. And that's why he was complaining and whining. But that was the only thing that spoiled a very beautiful last Shabbat of Jesus with his family and friends. Now, as we turn our attention to Palm Sunday, we have to recognize that it was an incredible mixed multitude that was there. So you, you cannot deal with a, a single response of the hearts because there was a variety of people there. As you put the, the combinations together from John 12 and Mark 11 and Matthew 21 and Luke 19, you you read that the disciples were there, okay, that's of course. You read that the Pharisees were there, these fundamentalists who believed in resurrection of the dead, they believed in angels, but they, they, they really hated Jesus because he wanted to heal people on the Sabbath day. And you've got the chief priests there, which are part of the Sadducees, the, the ruling class of the Jews from the old ancient Hasmonean dynasty that had themselves appointed as chief priests. They had nothing to do with the Levites, had nothing to do with the family there. And they were from the ancient Hasmonean dynasty, appointed by the Romans to govern the people of Israel by controlling their religion. Then you have the, the people of Jerusalem that came out to, to have a fiesta with Jesus and that... They, they they came there for for the the day of atonement. And then you have the crowds that had heard of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, and they wanted to see Lazarus, and they want to see this man that raised people from the dead. So there was a lot of people there, but sometimes lost in looking at all of those people and how they responded to Jesus on Palm Sunday, sometimes we lose focus of Jesus. So I asked the question, what was going on in the heart of Jesus on that first Palm Sunday? And that's where I want to focus you today. What was going on in the heart of our Savior? He knew he was fulfilling destiny. He knew that there were things that had to be accomplished this week. He knew he was reaching his goal. He knew that this was going to end with his suffering and his death. So we can't look at everything that filled his heart. But let me look at three thoughts with you today. First of all, I want you to notice the generous heart of Jesus, responding to generosity that flowed to him. In Mark chapter 11, verse 3, and in Luke 19, verse 31, and in Matthew 21, verse 3, we find the same passage. 
Jesus tells his disciples to go and get this colt that has never been ridden on. And he says, if anyone says to you, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it. And they will say, and will send it back immediately. So Jesus said, tell them that I need this and tell them I promise to send it back. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus didn't have to send anything back. Okay, he's, he's the son of God. And I want you to notice that in the spite of the fact of the suffering that he knows he was going to go through, it was important to him that it would be sent back. See, sometimes we, we, we see all that Jesus was going to have to go through. But Jesus still walked in integrity. And, you know, he, he's not going to get this man's cult all confused with everything else that's going on and the guy's going to lose something. He said, tell him. I will send it back. Now, generosity from that man flowed to Jesus because he trusted the promises of Jesus. He recognized his lordship, tell him the Lord needs it, and tell him I will send it back. So he trusted and recognized the lordship of Jesus, and he trusted the promise of Jesus. I will send it back. It amazes me today how many Christians today don't trust that Jesus will send it back. They, they, they believe in his lordship, they will bless him, they will give to Jesus. But they don't trust him to send it back. Philippians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul said, Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. He said, hey, God's going to bless you back. God, this is credited to your account in heaven. Jesus said it this way in Luke 6, verse 38, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. So here we have on the greatest day of Messiah being revealed to Israel, a day like no other day, a day when literally the fulfillment of prophecy from Daniel, where here comes the Messiah walking in, to the city of Jerusalem, the fulfillment of prophecy, riding on a colt just as it was prophesied. All of these prophecies coming true, the revelation of their Messiah. This is, this is a big day for Jesus and a big day for Jerusalem. And here is a man that Jesus asked to help him. And the man, because he recognized the lordship of Jesus, let him use his colt. And the man was humble enough to accept the promise of Jesus and have faith in the promise of Jesus, and the Lord will return it to you. Now, brothers and sisters, religion today always wants to say, well, we don't give to get, but we don't understand. It has nothing about doing with giving to get. It's about faith in his promise. Give, and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Beloved, in this, in this horrible season of COVID-19, so many of you have sowed seed. And you have been faithful. You have built God's house. You have sowed seed to do crusades and fill up churches of other pastors there in the province. And when we go out and do these crusades, our goal is just to, to help fill up those churches, fill up other churches. We train the pastors and help get people saved and fill up their churches. You, you, you've sowed seed to feed the poor. You, you've sowed so much to be a blessing to so many. I still remember years ago in the old, in the old um, convention center when T.L. Osborne preached for us, we gave him an offering. In those days, it was the moon to us. It was like $20,000. But that completely funded a crusade he did in Africa. And I'll never forget the tears coming down his face as he said, no church outside of the continental United States has ever given me an offering to do a crusade. He said, this is the first. And I thought, well, good. And I wondered how many of our family members has Jesus made sure, heard the gospel? Because we reap what we sowed. We made sure people heard the gospel who would not have had an opportunity to hear the gospel. How many of our family members have heard the gospel? See, God is no man's debtor. 
So you and I, you and I should never feel bad about accepting the promise that he will return it. Because that's the generosity and integrity of his heart that was still shown there, there, and that very first Palm Sunday with the, the crowds of adoration and the promise of the sufferings that awaited him. Tremendous pressure on his life. But he had the integrity and he had <laughs> the generosity to say, I'll make sure this is given back to you. And the guy didn't argue with him. Don't argue with Jesus. Look at the generosity and integrity of his heart to return and understand he's never changed. The second thing I want you to see is his heart of mercy. As he reached out to people whose hearts were hardened. Now, the, the mercy of Jesus always blows my mind. I mean, cause he, he is so much nicer than we are and so much more wonderful than we are. When he went into the temple courts, Matthew chapter 21, verses 14 to 16, on that first Palm Sunday, it says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And he said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and babies you have pre prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. So on that first Palm Sunday, he already started doing miracles in the temple. And the chief priests, Annas, Caiaphas, they saw the miracles. They saw the healings. They saw the, quote, wonderful things he did. And the children, I mean, the children were, Hosanna to the son of David. And all they did was get angry. Now, sometimes you look at it, you go, Jesus, you're just amazing. He stood right there in the face of Annas and Caiaphas, the chief priests and the scribes. He stood right there in their face in the temple courts and did wonderful things and healed people and miracles were being done. That was mercy. He was saying, hey, guys, you sit around in your skepticism. You sit around in your criticism. For three and a half years, you've criticized me everywhere I've went. For three and a half years, you've said things against me everywhere I've went. But now let me show you how real I am. You know the prophecies that Messiah will come riding on a donkey. You know the significance of this exact day in prophecy. You, you, you know I'm fulfilling prophecy. You, you, you see these miracles right in front of your eyes. This is the mercy. This is a heart of mercy from Jesus. And how did they respond? English Standard Version says in verse 15, they were indignant. New Century Version says they were very angry. They were very angry. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm just awed by this. I'm not awed at their anger. I'm awed at the mercy of Jesus. That fulfilling prophecy, Messiah, the son of David, entering on a colt, coming directly into the Father's house in fulfillment of prophecy, and then doing miracles right in front of their eyeballs. That is his mercy, saying, I want you to have an opportunity. You, you've never been with me in the provinces. You've never been with me in the Galilee. You've never been with me when I heal the sick and cast out demons. So I want you to see, because Messiah would come with healing in his wings. I want you to see what I told John's disciples. Go back and tell them what you see in here. I, I want you to see this. I want you to see that this is real. To get you past your criticism and your, your skepticism and your ugh. I want you to have an opportunity to soften your hearts as you see the reality of who I am. That's what Jesus was doing. And again, this, this whole thing just, just blows my mind. But all they did was get angry. And then Matthew 21, verse 17 says, and he left them. <laughs> He's talking about the chief priests and the scribes. He left them. 
he turned his back and walked away, knowing that the next time he saw these men, they were going to be wanting him dead. But he gave them a chance for mercy. <laughs> just, that, 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 that just blows my mind on so many levels. On the one hand, it blows my mind on that he would do this. On another hand, I would not ever want to be somebody that Jesus turns his back and walks away from. Now, can you imagine those men? <laughs> you know, they've been criticizing and criticizing and, and saying he's this and saying he's that for three and a half years. And now he fulfills prophecy in front of their eyes that they know. And he heals people and he does miracles and wonderful, wonderful things right in front of their eyes. And all they do is get more angry. <laughs> so he turns his back and he walks away. Wow. But now that's not the only mercy he showed that day. He not only showed mercy to the chief priests, but he showed mercy to all of their corruption that they had brought into the house of God. Mark chapter 11, verse 11 says, He entered Jerusalem, went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now we'll get more into this on Monday when he cleanses the temple, and we'll read this and we'll deal with this in morning devotions. But have you ever wondered what those guys felt like as they saw Jesus walking through the temple? <laughs> have you ever wondered? I mean, remember, the last time he was there, John chapter 2, verse 14, and in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. Wow, Jesus could. Jesus used anger to control situations. Jesus was not controlled by anger, but Jesus used a display of anger to get control of a situation. Now, we may not like that. That may not sound spiritual to us, but he is Jesus. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. You see, the way the chief priests had it all set up was the kickback system. And they overcharged people for turning their money into temple money that could be used because they couldn't use the Roman money. It had the pictures of the Roman Caesars on it, and they would not bring and honor a vow or fulfill a vow or bring a, a cash offering to God that had idols on the money. So they had special money minted in the temple that was, was to be used to, to not have any of those things on it. And they overcharged for the exchange. And they overcharged. One of the laws of Moses was if, if, you, if you live so far that you can't bring the, the, the pigeons, which is the offering of the poorest, or you can't bring the sheep, or you can't bring the ox, and then you turn them into money there and buy them in Jerusalem and use them there. But they again, they overcharged. They were exploiting the people. And Jesus just took a whip and drove everybody out. Now, that was the first time he went through. Now, at the end of his ministry, he comes back again, and he's walking around looking at all these guys. Can you imagine those guys just holding their stuff together? I mean, here, here's Jesus. Nobody stopped him the first time. And as you see on Monday, nobody stopped him the second time. I mean, this is a guy who heals the sick. This is a guy who opens blind eyes. This is a guy who cleanses lepers. This is a guy who raises the dead. Nobody stops him. But Jesus didn't do anything that day. He didn't make a whip and drive them out that day. He just walked in and looked around. Now, the foolish thing is, these guys stayed there. They, they didn't leave. They, they, should, they should have packed up their stuff and gone home, but they didn't. You see, religion has this idea that God's silence means acceptance. Ah, that God's silence means acceptance. Popular religion teaches us, as long as God is silent, everything is fine. They say, you know, when God's upset, he'll spank you. They'll say, when God's upset, you've displeased him. He sends bad circumstances. But if everything is quiet, it means God is accepting. Brothers and sisters, that's not true. When everything is wonderful, God says, well done, good and faithful servant. God's not silent when you're doing things properly. Now, some people, when God gets silent... They start making up little stories in their head. Oh, God said this to me, or God said that to me. 
it's not a time to make things up and, and pretend like God is speaking to you when it's not. And it's, it's, it's time to think about things that need to be corrected and changed in your life. When, when God is silent, it doesn't mean that he's accepting your lifestyle. When God went silent on them that day, when Jesus just walked through and quietly looked at everybody, that was not acceptance. That was a window of mercy to change. God's silence is a window of mercy to change. Let me say it again. God's silence is a window of mercy to change. Let me say it again. God's silence is a window of mercy to change. And in his silence that day, he showed mercy. He said, hey, I'm going to give you guys a little while to think about this. He didn't take, now tomorrow I'm going to take care of this. But he just, he was silent. They had to make a decision. Third thing about his heart, we talked about the generosity of his heart. We talked about the mercy that he showed on that first Palm Sunday. Now let me talk about the sadness of his heart. One of the strangest things for me to understand in the Bible is the love of God. I mean, it is, it is past comprehension. Throughout scriptures, we often overlook the fact that God's knowledge of his future never changes his love. God's knowledge of the future never changes his love. God created man knowing that he would fall and still chose to love him. God created Israel <laughs> and made them his chosen people, his own treasured possession, knowing that they would turn away and betray him. Throughout history, God has continued to love the church, knowing all the failures that we would have. I'm never quite sure I will ever understand how his love endures forever, that his love never fails. His love endures forever. No matter what mankind does, his love endures forever forever. Now here is Jesus about to die on a cross, a horrible death, and he knows this. From the time he was a boy, he had seen people die on the cross, and he knew that was his future. All of his life, he lived with this knowledge. And now as he comes in to fulfill his destiny and die on that cross, he looks at a city that he knows is going to reject him. He came to his own and his own received him not. He looks at a city that he knows is going to cry out for his suffering and his death. And he still loves them. Luke 19, verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that even you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but they are now hidden from your eyes. For the days will come when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. He prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Almost 40 years from that day that he made that prophecy. He said, you know what? And, and really, when they did, they, when they tore down the temple and they tore down the, the whole temple complex, they did not leave one stone upon another. When you come with us to Israel, we'll walk you on some of the ancient streets that are like 100 feet underground. And then you'll come up and you'll see the stones that have been pushed off the top of Temple Mount. Not one stone was left upon another up there on Temple Mount. The city was flattened. The city was leveled. And Jesus is weeping for that city. He's weeping for people who are about to kill him. His love endures forever. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. So when you, you sit back and you, you think through Palm Sunday from just a little ant on the shoulder of Jesus watching him you see his integrity and generosity to return what he didn't have to. 
because that's who he is. That's, that's his character. You, you see him showing mercy to people who deserve no mercy, but that's who he is. That's his character. And you see his enduring love because that's who he is. That's his character. And he never changes. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, if you're listening to me today and your life is not right with God, today is a wonderful day to start fresh. Today is a wonderful day to receive forgiveness. Today is a wonderful day to let Jesus change your life. His mercy is here for you. His generosity is here for you. His love is here for you. You just need to open your heart. Not harden your heart like those chief priests did that day. (laughs) How could they do that? They hardened their hearts like Pharaoh of old. But if you will soften your heart, he will forgive you. He will change your life. I want you to pray this prayer with me. And if you're gathered as a family and one of, one of the person wants to pray it as a family, you pray it together with them. Kaya, they're not, they're not embarrassed. Ulite natin. Father, say this with me. Father, in Jesus' name, I come to you. I thank you for your great love. I thank you that you gave your son to die on a cross for me, to take the punishment of my sins and to rise again to give me new life. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask forgiveness. Forgive me for all I have done. This day, I renounce sin. This day, I turn from my sinful life and I turn my life to you to follow Jesus every moment of every day for the rest of my life. Father, in Jesus' name, change my heart and change my life. I believe in Jesus Christ born of a virgin, suffered and died on a cross for me, rose again on a third day, and is sitting at your right hand. I trust in Jesus as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, some of your family are going to talk to you. We're going to walk you through first truths, Teach you some basic things that you need to understand about reading your Bible every day and praying today because you just started a relationship with Jesus. Now you need some follow through. All right. Just like a young man, he can't just take a girl out for one milk tea. He's got to have some follow through. You need some follow through now and and grow in your relationship with Jesus. And they're going to tell you about coming to church. They're going to teach you about reading your Bible. They're going to teach you about praying every day and say, well, what do you say? You can't see God. You kind of feel like you know, you belong sala ob if you're just talking to yourself. No, he's listening. And the way you talk to him is just open your heart and talk to him. You can't say anything wrong because he already knows your heart. So don't worry about saying anything wrong. I think of many of the prayers I prayed in my early days and I think, <laughs> oh, he loves me. Congratulations on your salvation. All right, folks, we're going to see you. Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night for School of the Cross. We're going to see you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for morning devotions where we go through the story of the first Holy Week. We'll see you then.